welcome today again at our discussion of the law, the aspects and exactly what is the law of God. We have seen in scripture already that the law of God is eternal. The law of God is given to us and it is not taken away. We have seen that the law of God has been uh, changed, thrown out of the church, uh, some people again add to the law. But today we are going to discuss the different portions and parts, the divisions of the law. Now I know the law is one and all the laws are actually part of this one big group. And all the laws are actually able to be divided into many separate of these parts. But we are trying to set a practical division in the law so that we can see and decide about how the parts of the law is to be executed, done, changed. And today we will again use scripture as our basis, our foundation, because that is our only standard. Remember, we're not talking on behalf of or for any denominational church, but the word of God is our standard. And we will see what his word is, his standard for his law. He's God who gave the law, only He can change it. Um, and this must be the foundation of all our talks and everything that we say. So look at, let us look at the divisions then of the law. Now we are going to divide the law in a few parts and the first one then is the worship laws. Now actually all the laws are worship laws because the law is to give us the correct way through which the real creator God should be worshipped. But there are specific laws pertaining to the worship and God's standards of how he should be worshipped. Now who is worshipped can never change. There is only one living creator God. And because of that, there is only one I am allowed to worship. All worship is His because He is the only true God. Secondly, how He is worshipped cannot change. God is the same forever. And the way in which we should worship Him cannot change. Yes. There is practical because of surroundings, because of area, because of the, uh, the age we live in. There are changes in the practical execution, but not of the law, of how he is to be worshipped. And that is very, very important. We should remember that in everything that we do, everything that we say today. It can never change. The way we worship God is standard. Included in these are the laws speaking specifically against heathen practices. Now for a short while I'm going to stand still just on, on a few of these problems because you will agree with me if I use heathen and pagan practices to serve God the question stands do I serve the real God? Is that how the real creator God is to be served? I cannot see how I can serve God in the way of the world, in the way of pagan gods. That is not possible. So let us look at what the Bible says. Again, the word of God on pagan practices. And we will read today from Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 23. You may not live according to the customs of the nations which I drove out before you, because they do all these things and therefore I detest them. It seems like one of the reasons why God has rejected the nations and drove them out before Israel is because of their worship practices. And God specifically tells Israel, you shall not worship me in the way other people worship their gods. Now this, Leviticus 20, is important for us to remember in all the things we are going to say now. You are not allowed 
to worship the true God in ways of pagan nations. Nations who do not know the real living God. God forbids that. So in other words, it also means that we are not allowed to take a practice or a worship to foreign nation, for foreign gods, change it, shall I say, Christify it, change it into a church pattern, change it to a church religion, a church festival, and then say, we are serving the true God only. This forbids that. We cannot change a heathen practice into a serving God practice. God does not allow that at all. Now, if I bow three times, and you will agree with me on this one, because I think everybody will agree, but as you agree on this, I ask you to also look at the others we're going to talk about, and perhaps agree with the fullness of the lie of people saying, I worship the true God. Remember, this is all about finding the way in which to serve the only true God and Him alone. Now, if I bow down three times a day, or bow down three times in the direction of the east, bow down on my knees and stand up and bow down for three times in a row, and come commit myself and say this is the way that God should be worshipped then I use a Islamic practice which is not ordered in the Bible but that is the way in which they do it and if I practice that I follow a non-creator God practice I think you will agree with me father cannot be honored in this way so if that practice is not acceptable, what about other things that we do? If I acknowledge the day of the sun god as set apart, as is confessed by the Roman Church, and when it was established, the statement was made that it should be honored and separated because we want to bring honor to the living uh, uh, to the sun god. This is the day the sun god should be honored on. We will look at their own statements. We will not believe hearsay. We will look at what they said themselves about changing the day from God's Shabbat to honoring the sun god on his day. Now, how can I honor the sun god and then say that I worship that my only God is the true Creator God and honor the Sun God's day. Think about it. Don't react and don't emotionally listen to what I'm saying. Listen carefully. Consider the, the consequences of what I'm saying. If I say I believe in and I serve and worship only the true living God, I should honor His day not the day of the sun god, then I recognize and honor the sun god. That I cannot do. And that I don't think is God's will at all. Um, if we may share with you just a little bit of the background. Sunday worship is traced back to 111 to 138 after Yeshua came. After the followers of Yeshua who lived with Him, uh, who've been taught by Him, who were the leaders and took out the teachings into the world, after each and every one of them died, suddenly a change in the whole concept, as we did in the first two DVDs, of, of the religion and the worship to God, crept in, was brought in. And this was one of them. The Romans at that time had a very big anti-Jewish and everything that looks Jewish they was thrown out, burned and destroyed. And because of this policy of separation from the Jewish practices uh, a lot of claim to the truth actually were lies because the truth were destroyed. Now 
Um, this is the reason why it started, not as some people claim, because of Yeshua's resurrection. Because on the first day that Yeshua was uh, resurrected from the grave was the day of a feast. And that's why to be shown before the Father as the first sheaf so that me and you can be accepted by Father. Perhaps we'll speak about that a little bit later. But that was the real reason why Yeshua was resurrected from the grave on the first day of the week during that time, which was then part of the feast and was necessary a fulfillment of prophecy. Not because suddenly a new day that was separated unto God was introduced. Just think about that. Why then should we think about other reasons if that was not the real reason for Sunday worship? Was it perhaps, as the church uh, of that time declared, to honor the sun god? Each and every one was commanded at that time to obey the Sunday as, and show respect to the sun god that was worshipped. In 321, we all know, Constantine made this law. Uh, it became a fixed law in the Roman Empire that all subjects of the Roman Empire should keep the Sunday as the day of the Lord and as a day of rest. Now, there is no biblical reason it was introduced by man as declared by the church itself. We will look at that right now. Let us first look at the definition of Sunday in just two of the many uh, dictionaries that we can use of that. We use an older one because in the older dictionaries, we can find the older meaning which was given at that time. Uh, the Skaf Herza Encyclopedia says the following. Sunday, from Dies Solus, on the Roman calendar, is the day of the sun, etc., etc. It confirms what we are saying. Sunday is the day of the sun, coming from the word Solus Dios. That, that is what the meaning of the day is. Let us look at John Eady. Writing in the Bible Cyclopedia, in page 561, he writes the following. Sunday was a name given by the heathen to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. Yes, it's the first day of the week, not the seventh, not the Lord's day, not the day belonging to the only creator God. It is a day introduced by man to be separated from the day introduced by God. So the question stays, who do you follow? If we really are serious, and I believe listening to this, you have a desire to obey God. If you have that desire, let us obey Him through His laws and not man's laws, because the church itself can okay, given that. Before we see what it says in their statements, let's look at what Daniel chapter 7 Verse 25 says, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. He will speak mighty words, speaking about the Antichrist. He will speak mighty words against the Almighty and try to persecute the children of the Almighty or tire them. He will aim to or try to change the set or appointed times of God or God's set apart days and laws. Now this verse is freely translated from the Hebrew. The Bible says, The Antichrist will persecute the children of the Almighty after they went against God. Now that we know, the world is going against God. People are persecuting the children of God. Those are both true. But the third part of this prophecy is, He will try to change the set times and appointed feasts of God. Leviticus chapter 23 says that the Shabbat, the seventh day, is the first of these set apart feasts that God appointed. Catholic record of September 1 and 1923 states the following. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Shabbat observance is proof of that fact. Wow! Wow! We can change the Bible 
We are above the Bible. The Roman system says we have introduced Sunday. And it's not a lie. They're right. Yes, they did. God didn't. Who do you follow? Being Roman, Protestant, doesn't matter which part. Don't we follow still Roman laws? I do not believe for one second. That's God's will. Secondly, the Catholic world, March 1894, page 809. She took the pagan Sunday and made it the Christian Sunday. And thus, the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder or Baal, became the sacred Sunday, sacred to Jesus. Well, again, I need to say, I'm sorry, I cannot reconcile with that. I cannot accept that. I cannot say that that is what I believe. That which is worship to Baal cannot be changed according to Leviticus chapter 20. Verse 23 says very clearly, that cannot be changed into a way to worship the true living God. So let us accept the word of God and not do this. I Hope and pray before God that you will see the lie and accept the truth of God's day. Unfortunately, there are many others. Uh, just mentioning two of them. What about Christmas? Christmas is not anything to do with the Christ of the Greek. No, it's got nothing to do with the living God. It's a heathen festival introduced on the birthday or the founding day of the sun god again, the 25th of December. All the practices, but all the practices that is done on Christmas and around the Christmas festival is heathen and pagan festivals. Even the early morning sunrise uh, prayer and meetings that is held predates Christianity even predates the birth of Yeshua it comes from heathen practices why? to honor the sun God as it rises up above the horizon that has just been changed into serving the real God again Leviticus says we cannot do that and I prefer not to do that. Easter, just the name itself, should already ring alarm bells in your heart because Easter, Easter, Ishtar comes from exactly that name, Ishtar, which is the fertility goddess plus a lot of other things, goddesses and gods in the Bible with its names and the derivations of this name. I cannot serve and Let's be honest, if this is the two main feasts in the church where you serve God, heathen feasts, festivals not directed to the living Creator God. My dear friend, won't you just stand still a little and if God speaks to you, confess this before Him and find His will and not this lie, the church has introduced. How many pagan heathen practices are in your worship? Can we really claim to serve the only living creator God by doing it with heathen pagan practices? I do not think that at all is possible. Let us now look at the second part of the laws or the second division of the laws, namely the moral laws. Now, this is the way of life and standards that God has given us. He's the same God, He never changes. I do not believe that His standards for man in serving and obeying Him can change. No, it is still the same God. And therefore His standards stay the same. This we call the moral laws. 
because it's about the standards in which we live. These standards stay eternally the same. So again, just as the worship laws cannot change, God's moral laws cannot change. It stays the same. You know, if I look at the TV and what's happening on television uh, these days, and what people tell me, because honestly we do not have one, if the things that is shown, what we hear is shown on TV today, was shown the first day TV was allowed in South Africa, it would have been closed down immediately. But that's not the way these things work. Slowly but surely the lie has been introduced. Slowly but surely the standard became more and more and more away from God. To look like the world, to be like the world. And now today, all the church people, everybody accept these standards. The devil has made people used to the standards so that they can now accept. I will use the example of the frog. We all know that example in many teachings. People have heard that. If you throw a frog into waters of 60 degrees or more, that frog will jump out immediately to save himself. But if you th put that frog in cold water, eat it slowly and slowly and slowly, that frog will stay in the water, be boiled and die before he recognizes it. This is the principle which the devil used so that we can be caught up into standards which is not acceptable. Why don't you go and check the TV, movies, anything around you in the world, how people dress and walk in the streets? I ask you, just take the Word of God, use it as a standard, measure these things against that, and then tell me that it is acceptable to God. I do not believe that. We have already looked at the, the commandments and the ten headings of God in the law in the previous DVD. Why don't you go back and see what does it really mean to be child of God according to God's moral standards. The third division that we are using for the laws are the ceremonial laws or the feasts. Now this is the one for instance and the place where the church and many people will immediately say but the ceremonial laws, the feasts, is past. We don't need that anymore. Let us look at the purpose of the feasts and see if we need them. The main purpose of the feasts and the seven feasts that God has spread over the year is to show man God's involvement in man He created. God's love, God's care, God's salvation in, for mankind which He created. And in the seven feasts, we can see that. Even the simple teaching and simple concept of salvation can be better understood. And I tell you the truth, in all my studies and all the things that I did, studying salvation on the cross, studying what Yeshua really did for us. When I studied the feast, and especially the feast of Pesach, understanding the role of the priest, understanding exactly what sacrifices and offerings meant and how Yeshua fulfilled a tremendous amount of these principles to bring our salvation. Our understanding of God's salvation became more complete. Why don't you study the feasts and see the richness God wants to introduce in our lives the richness of understanding God's intervention in man's life. We will be surprised on what it is. Now the seven feast uh, is for the year, right through the year. But before that, if we read Leviticus chapter 23, we will see that the first feast mentioned after he's saying, this is God's set times and appointed feasts. Then the first feast he speaks about is the weekly feast of the Shabbat. On the seventh day, God has given us a weekly feast. We already spoke about Shabbat. It should be a feast. If it's a burden, it's not from God. It should be a feast. 
Now the seven annual feasts which God gave us is for a wonderful purpose. God loves His creation and He shows us through His feast. The first of those is Pesach. At Pesach, uh, on the first month of the Jewish calendar, when God took Israel out of Egypt, the whole picture of salvation becomes complete. God does not want to save you and leave you in Egypt. God wants to take away your sins by His blood if you just allow Him. And then take you out of Egypt. Separate you through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, specifically following the Feast of Pesach. Then take you out of Egypt the life of sin, moving out, disobeying God and God's law. God give us a separated love, accepting and living according to His standards and law. The third of the feasts, the wave offering of the first fruits, is done on the first day of the week of the unleavened festival. On the Feast of Unleavened Bread, during the first day of the week or Sunday, in that week, the first sheaf of the harvest is brought to the temple and it's waved before God as an acceptance of the first fruit so that the whole harvest can be accepted. In looking at this picture, it's such a tremendous meaning that Yeshua was resurrected on that specific day. Yeshua was not resurrected to start a new set-apart day. He was resurrected on the first day of the week to fulfill this feast of God. Where He had to show Himself before the Father to be accepted as the first fruits so that you and I can be accepted into God's harvest as His harvest. What a wonderful meaning. Then we can understand. Let's look at it. Yeshua, the fulfillment of Pesach Lamb by being our Pesach Lamb. Yeshua being our salvation. Then taking us out of a life of sin by giving us a separated life. You and I should not live in sin or against the law of God anymore. Because this is the order in which God has given it to us. And Yeshua has showed Himself before the Father that the harvest can be accepted. And in that way, you and me are accepted into the harvest of God. What a wonderful picture. Exactly 50 days, 7 times 7 days, 7 weeks of 7 days, 49 days later, the day after that on the 50th day, is the next feast of Shavuot, or the feast of weeks, the feast of the first harvest. This is very important, especially the number of seven has great significance in the Bible. Seven times seven, forty-nine, has a great significance in the Bible of fullness. And in the fullness of time, God has poured out His Spirit on His children. Now the Greek word that was used there, Pentecost, actually means fifty days. So, on this day, Shavuot, which is the days of the, the feast of weeks, the Spirit of God was poured out on Shavuot. God saved His children. He separated them from sin. They were accepted before the Father. Now He empowers them to live the life of obedience to God. What a wonderful Father God we serve. During the seventh month then, not later on Tishri, the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, on the first day of that month, is the blowing of the shofar. The day which a big noise is made to announce the presence and the coming of the king. Now, just in the meaning of the blowing of the shofar, which is the announcement, of the coming of the King. I will not be surprised if that is the day on which Yeshua our Master was born to announce the coming of the King. There is quite significant in understanding that Yeshua was born during the seventh month 
of the Jewish calendar during this time of the feasts of Sukkot and that which comes before. Because exactly 30 years later, Yeshua started his ministry. At the time of Sukkot, being baptized, it's not a strange uh, procedure that was suddenly started. Being baptized in the time, the 40 days running up to Yom Kippur, which is on the 10th day of the 7th month. For people to lay down their old lives and their sin of the past and accept a clean new life in God. Stand up in a new nature and character of God. That's what baptism is. Standing up in a new nature and character of God to be accepted at Yom Kippur. Now, when we come into the life of Yeshua, we also should lay down our old life and live in a new life to be accepted before God, living according to His law. We cannot reject the law. That is the standard which God has given us after which we should live. Ten days later, the blowing of the shofar is Yom Kippur. This is the most set apart day on the calendar. Because this is the day where God has given the tribe of Israel, the people of Israel and us, the opportunity that all our sins, everything we still do every day which is wrong, being covered. Yom Kippur means the covering. The covering of that which stands between us and God. And the blood of Yeshua has saved us. The Spirit has given us the power. And on this day, God says that He will cover those things standing between us. So that He can come and we be accepted with the white clothes of a set-apart life before God. And Yom Kippur is by both a fast as well as Shabbat. As is many of the feasts, there is Shabbat in every beginning of the feast, which God has given extra. We, we should understand that also to be able to understand a lot of the verses in the Bible that doesn't make sense. He talks about the Shabbats in plural form. This is how God has set out the days to show us His commitment to us. And then the last one, of course, five days later, five days after Yom Kippur, is Sukkot. Sukkot, um, the Feast of booths, can it be called? Uh, where people make flimsy booths to live in, to acknowledge our dependency on the living Creator God. But most importantly, at this time at Sukkot, it's the feast of the final harvest. That is when the fruit of the trees comes in and being brought before God. And we have a feast of the fruits that come in before God during Sukkot. And then the eighth day, the day after the Sukkot is finished, that's the great day of Yahuwah. Which we believe that is the day where God's going to be judging the earth. God will judge the earth at that time. Because Yeshua is coming back during the time of the final harvest. During Sukkot. Can you see the, the tremendous significance and the tremendous meaning of the seven feasts that God gave us. The next in our laws or divisions of the laws, we talk about the sacrificial laws. Now, we will speak in depth on the sacrifices. And there are five sacrifices that God has given us. And uh, if Father give us the time, perhaps next time, time after, we will speak specifically about the changes and how the changes came into the law. No, nothing has fell away. But there's changes in the way in which we practice it. Notice, the sacrifices, the sacrificial laws are not abolished. They are only brought to completion. Just as I had to bring my physical land to the temple, you know, I brought it to the curtain of the temple, lay my hand on the lamp, then slaughter it, and by laying my hand on it, I transfer my transgressions to the lamp, which is then laid upon the altar in my stead. And because of that, my sins are taken 
through the Lamb being forgiven. But that is only showing forth to what really happened when Yeshua died on the cross. His blood now paying for our sins. I don't have to bring a lamb anymore. The Lamb of God has taken His place. But I have to place my hand on the Lamb of God being a spiritual significance of I have to accept Him as the mediator, as standing between me and God, as taking my sins upon Himself, just as I had to lay my hand on the lamp at the door of the temple. So I have to lay my hand on the Lamb of God, Yeshua, on His cross, so that I can enter into the full flow, into the full work of the temple. I have for my forgiveness also to place my hand on the lamb. That lamb is Yeshua. No, the sacrifices is not done away with. The sacrifice of Yeshua, I still have to accept, make my own. This, the, the, the substitute sacrifice is still that, but through Yeshua. I have to put my hand on Yeshua as sacrifice. Before it is valid, for me, a substitute sacrifice. Many people don't understand it. Yeshua didn't die on the cross and therefore all of us are saved. Yeshua was the sacrifice. But without you laying your hand on the lamb on that sacrifice, accepting in the spiritual realm, He sacrificed for yourself. Acknowledging Yeshua is my sacrifice for sins. Our sins are not forgiven. We have to accept that. This is of cardinal importance. And that's why I can't just throw the sacrifices and the sacrificial laws away. Each and every one of those sacrificial laws have a purpose and a meaning in my acceptance of the Lamb of God as sacrifice. Nothing can fall away. We've already seen in previous DVDs that law is one. Leviticus chapter 4 verse 2 says that. Leviticus chapter 4 Verse 2, speak to the children of Israel and say, If anybody sins unknowingly against any of the commands which Yahuwah commanded not to be done, and anybody transgresses. Now, it's also said in Yaakov chapter 2 verse 10, One law is enough for me to break the law. We've already spoken about that. I'm not going to in that again. The law is one. If I break one, I break the law, not a law. And therefore, none of these laws can fall away. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8. Above he says, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor were pleased with them, which are offered according to the law. And then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first in order that he may establish the second. Uh, let's just stand still a moment and see what happens. This verse is quoted wrongly often. It doesn't say the sacrifice law is not valid anymore. Look and listen carefully. It says the sacrificial law is not what it was all about. That was the way and principle through which God showed us what will happen. And then in the second verse, in verse 9, Yeshua, come and Yeshua comes and says to us the following, I am ready to be that sacrifice. This is what it means. It's not that God threw away the sacrifices. It's that Yeshua was ready to replace the sacrifices of the temple in Himself. And become our sacrifice. Let us look at the offerings, at the five offerings. And just at the f Yeshua being the fulfillment of those offerings. Uh, hopefully we will discuss the sacrifices in detail a little bit later uh, on a in the next time. Let's look at it quickly. Yeshua is our sin offering. Uh, Hebrew chapter 10 uh, verse 6 and many other verses says that as well. But I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 9. Let us look. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. 
So, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time without sin and to salvation. Now, um, there's quite something significant in here. Yeshua died for our sins. He became the sacrifice and will come again to complete our salvation. We should work out our salvation as Shaul or Paul, as you know him, said. In the meantime, by obeying the law of God. Yeshua has been the sin offering so that we can have the opportunity, the privilege, accepting Him as sacrifice and being saved. The second is the trespass offering. Let's look at Yeshua as our trespass offering. You can also go and read Isaiah. Uh, as you know it, Yeshayahu chapter 53 verse 10. But we will read from Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Most of these we will read from Hebrews. A wonderful book to study the sacrifices and the laws of God. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Messiah, the anointed one, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And that's exactly what the trespass offering did to cleanse the conscience, to cover so that there is no sin between me and the living God. Let's look also at Yeshua's peace offering or thanks offering as it's also called. A part of the thanks offering is the peace offering. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 That's the next verse. And for this reason He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yeshua is the restoration of relationship. And that is the meaning of the peace offering or the thanks offering. Yeshua is the restoration between man and God. Let's look at Yeshua's burnt offering. The burnt offering which were brought twice a day and on every festival the burnt offering uh, which was part of the daily spiritual life of Israel and we will read again from Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrew chapter 10 verse 11 and 12 and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Isn't what it says? Ministering daily, the daily sacrifices, the burnt offering that had to be brought, Yeshua was our burnt offering. Being all our offerings, as well as the grain offering, the drink offering, that had to be poured out, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6 to 10, being also that, all the sacrifice, even at Pesach, Yeshua becomes our Pesach man. Let us read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, even as you are unleavened. For indeed, Messiah, or the Anointed One, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. The question now is, which part of the laws can, must be differently applied, which stays the same? In these cases, the new covenant will be our guideline. If it is not changed in the new covenant, it stays the same. That's very logical. We have already seen that the law or the handling thereof can change. And we will give specific examples to show and prove that. But next time, we will in detail see how the change takes place in some of the laws and what is the application of the specific laws which change. Our foundation, the law cannot change. The last of these laws which we will look at quickly today is the set apart laws. We will read Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1. 
You are sons of Yahuwah your God. You may not, for the sake of a dead person, cut yourself nor shave a bald spot on your foreheads, because you are a set apart nation unto you are your God. And you are has chosen you to be a nation as his own possession from all the nations that are on the earth. Therefore, you should not do this, and you should do this. Because listen what God says, you are a separated people. You cannot be, you cannot live, you cannot do as the other nations do. I have set you apart to make you a standard, to show my will to the nations. And therefore God has given us laws to set us apart. And you will agree with me, that cannot change. Specific one, something that was mentioned, and which people talk about a lot. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27. You may not cut the edges of the hair of your head round, nor blemish the edge of your beard. This was, was quite a deep study to go and find the right words and to make sure what the verses in the Bible says. And through the study it was very clear that in that time the priests of other nations of Baal and other nations has cut certain forms and patterns into the hair and beards. God forbids that. And this round cutting of the hair was specifically an sun god worship and an heathen practice which was taken in to some churches, but forbidden by God. And also, to abuse or cut portions into your beard, to blemish the form of your beard, in other words, for specific reasons. Specifically, as the Bible says also, for uh, people that is dead, um, as a form of mourning, that is forbidden by God. But actually it is written in such a way that it stands separate from that to mean you're not allowed to do it. Full stop. Doesn't matter what time. And then also the law about specific wool and cotton being mixed into a cloth. Now that law specifically is in Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 11. Which in study revealed that there is a specific cloth made in heathen practice and worship and sacrifices. It's called Shadnets. And this cloth was made from wool and cotton. And God forbids the use of the cloth mixed with wool and cotton for that sacrificial purposes. You go study, make sure that you understand the will of God in these things. I was mistaken, it was not the last one. Uh, the next law that we will look in depth in a uh, further DVD also is the health or the food laws. This is very important. God desires, wants us to be healthy. Therefore, He's given us some laws. And it's not only to be healthy, there are also specific reasons for that. And we have to discuss that to understand. Shall we again quickly just summarize the Word of God pertaining the law? In the Bible, there's a thousand laws. The Ten Commandments is the headings under which this laws come. Above the Ten Commandments there is the heading of the law of love. At the beginning of this law of love, there is a specific statement that Yahweh is our only God. He is our God. We cannot serve Him through His laws. We cannot obey His laws without accepting Him as our God. And above that, the first word of that statement, is Shemaur. Listen, hear, and do. That is how God summarizes His law. Listen, hear, and do. May God give us the wisdom, the understanding, the insight on His laws so that we can understand His will and purpose and obey. So be quiet for a second. Thank you, Father, that we have the privilege to worship you according to your standards. Forgive us our willfulness, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, and accept your laws as our standards. Through the sacrifice and the name, the character and authority of Yeshua, our Master. Amen.
that God cannot lie He promised to save His people He never changed His mind Today He still calls them my people My people, my people Can't you see? Feel